The world in 2015, a year marked by violence and conflict and events which deepened fear and mistrust. On this end of year review, we look at the stories that mattered and ask, are we heading towards more polarization or cooperation in 2016? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to this special end of year edition of Inside Story. I'm Sami Zaydan. It wasn't all bad news in 2015. Iran finally reached that major agreement with Western pals on its nuclear program. And negotiators from nearly 200 countries signed a deal committing the world to fight climate change. But 2015 was also the year when events seemed to divide us, increasing our fear and suspicion of one another, not leaving much room for the middle ground. In some ways, the first big story of the year was a tragic indication of where things were to go. On January the 7th, gunmen stormed the offices of satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo in Paris and killed 11 people. It was followed by other ISIL-led or inspired attacks, again in Paris, but also in Beirut, Tunis, San Bernardino, and elsewhere. Along with events in the Middle East, this year exposed how divided Muslim and Western countries are on how to deal with the problem of ISIL and its ideology. The armed group's attacks combined with an unprecedented refugee crisis also triggered a debate on what it meant to be European or American and the place of Muslims in those societies. And served to embolden right-wing populists like Donald Trump and Marine Le Pen, bringing their often provocative views from the political fringe deeper into the mainstream. 2015 also revealed a crisis in the European project on how to collectively deal with refugees and the aftermath of the financial crisis. Greece's financial problems tested the limits of European solidarity. And if that weren't enough, researchers told us in 2015 that the wealth gap and inequality rose to levels not seen for 80 years. And they told us extreme weather became more regular because of climate change. So a lot of polarization stories to get through now. Let's bring our guests into the show. We have here joining us in the studio, Basma Mumani, professor at the Basili School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo. And in New York, Arjun Apadurai, Godan professor of media, culture and communication at New York University. Arjun is also a socio-cultural anthropologist. Good to have you with us. If they say ladies first, so let's start here in the studio. Uh, are we heading towards more economic and wealth polarization in 2016. I'm sure you remember that report that came out from Credit Suisse in October that said wealth inequality was increasing and it's now reached such a level that 1% owns more than half of the world's wealth. Is that where we're going in 2016, do you think? Yeah, unfortunately it is. I mean, the, the gap between the rich and poor keeps, you know, uh, growing wider and wider. But at the same time, one of the things that we don't talk about is that more people are being raised out of poverty. So even though that we have... That was precisely the point. Is that how does that fit in with the numbers in India and China, which are entering the middle class? Exactly. And that's really the success story is a lot of it is East and South Asia that have seen uh, very large populations, of course, but also coming out of poverty, which is really quite a success story, both for India and China, which really are leading the way. But at the same time, we are seeing a concentration of wealth. We're seeing the rich get richer and much of the rest of the world out of that stage of poverty, but yet not really making it into the not middle catching class. Up Absolutely. With the, with the 1%. Absolutely. I interesting. Uh, Arjun, when we talk about uh, one of the aspects, I guess, of, of wealth inequality that we have talked a lot about in 2015 has to do with how to get out of the financial crisis in Europe, um, the austerity battle. That seems to have been won by proponents of austerity. Does that mean the rich get richer and the poor get poorer in Europe too? I certainly hope not, although I do agree with our colleague uh, from Canada that uh, that trend appears to be in place. I think a great deal will depend on central bankers and uh, governments to restrain the ability of the extremely rich to take outsized risk in which they uh, are the sole beneficiaries of the upside with the rest of the world catching the downside. That means stronger regulation, uh, 
of the most risky financial instruments, both in Europe, the United States, and increasingly elsewhere in the world. Now, what does that mean? Now, when you look at some of the, the research that's been done, they say that basically countries with greater income inequality, like the USA or the United Kingdom, have greater problems related to other issues, mental health issues, imprisonment rates, teenage birth rates. Does this mean if the world as a whole, we think, is heading towards more global inequality, are we heading towards a world with more problems? I think uh, there's a good chance of that, again, unless we are both alert, proactive, and patient. These problems will not be fixed in 2016. They will take a good 10 years to handle. They will take strong global governance mechanisms, high degrees of consensus, the way we saw in the climate crisis, but uh, that we do not see yet in relation to finance, health, crime, and borders. No. Bessima, why are we talking about you know, the problems of polarization? Is this a consequence, some would say, of globalization, of, of corporations and their activities not being restrained? Yeah, undoubtedly, I mean, part of it is about globalization. You know, one of the challenges of globalization, it's harder for countries to be successful. I mean, when we put, uh, when we used to have the situation where there were tariffs and protectionist policies, it really allowed countries to be insulated from the global economy. Globalization has obviously brought down so many of those barriers, and so it is more difficult for countries to compete. It's more difficult for countries to uh, be able to uh, acquire uh, taxes in terms of corporate taxes. We're seeing, in fact, if we look at some of the commitments of the G20, it was really about but trying to bring down the kinds of barriers to collecting corporate taxes, which is a big issue. Increasingly, countries are unable to get corporate taxes because they evade taxes by jumping from place to place to place and using a lot of times tax loopholes to their advantage. So there's definitely a corporate responsibility here, and only through the kind of global economic governance arrangements, whether it's through the G20 and other mechanisms, can we get that kind of mm. agreement to really make sure that those loopholes are actually fixed and narrowed. Uh, what do you think, Arjun? Have we learned the lessons, I guess, of uh, the financial yes. crisis when we were supposed to, to review the deregulation yes. movement? Has that worked? Y yes. Well, I think the, the point that my colleague just made is part of a deeper process, and that is that very few countries, including the very wealthiest, anymore really control their national economies. Indeed, one may ask whether the idea of a national economy for anyone still holds good. The economy has gotten away from the nation state in the last 30 years especially, and as a consequence, we are seeing a great deal of trouble with regulating the global economy because nation states don't have that capacity. We are also seeing, I think, as a consequence of the loss of control over national economies by the very richest and the very poorest, a series of results in the social, cultural, and political sector, which have to do with compensations for the loss of economic sovereignty worldwide. I, I like where you're going with this thought, Arjun. L let me ask you to stay with it for a second, because when you talk about national sovereignty, we're also sure. now getting into politics. And one of the big themes this yes. year in 2015 has been the collapse of the political middle ground in many countries. Uh, so connecting the dots in what you're saying, as countries feel they're, they're losing control over their economies and feeling they're losing control over national sovereignty, is that pushing political polarization where, you know, some countries like Greece and Spain move towards the left wing and some countries, other countries, move towards, I don't know, the SD in Sweden or national front in, in France, and po political polarization is what we're heading well, to I in 2016? Well, I think the move to the right, yes, the move to the right is a worldwide trend. I think it needs to be observed closely. It's an important comparative trend, uh, and I think it has to do indeed with the tendency of political elites and emerging middle classes and even some parts of the working class to compensate for the lack of economic control over their own lives by asserting control where they can, which is to say over dissent, over minorities, over things like crime, over the search for terrorists locally. These are matters that countries can control, and when you can't control the economy, 
you're going to overemphasize these things. And when you overemphasize them, there is, of course, a natural uh, opening for the political right, which is good at closing things down, but not excellent at opening them up. Best man, are we looking at a sort of vicious circle then for 2016 as we try and look ahead here? Some of these factors all seem interlinked. You were talking about globalization, the role of corporations, maybe, shall we say, putting farmers and software developers in a weaker position in much of the developing world. But then we've seen this, for example, another big issue has been the move of immigration or migration and refugees fleeing towards the developed world. Is this like which, which drives the right wing? I mean, is this a, a vicious circle that we should expect to continue in 2016? You know, I think the trend is really that the centrist has lost the ground that they used to have, which was to really appeal to a wide range of interests. And we've mm. lost that. So what we have really is a polarization where economic populism, and it can come from both the right and the left wing. It really does come from both sides. In the case of the, the right wing, it comes in the form of xenophobia. It often blames uh, migrants and others, the, always the other uh, national security uh, concepts come through as all being sort of part of the problem of why they're not succeeding in that uh, that populist sense and the same could be said for the left and in the left it's all about the lack of redistribution blaming the corporate and it's really about the fact that we have this loss of the middle ground the loss of the centrist viewpoint and we can point to a lot of reasons why that is increasingly I think also we have to be you know critical of the media the media likes extremes the media is attracted in many ways I mean Trump can get that kind of megaphone that you just don't get if you're a centrist and so it's really a matter of, unfortunately, we've created a lot of echo chambers, and we see that in social media. It's less and less become people who are in the center that get you know, often followed and listened to, but it's the extremes of either side. And this is a real, uh, I think, uh, campaign in the 2016, whether it's in the US or other parts of Europe, where we really are, uh, I should say, at a maturity of social media and other mm. forms of media. And I doubt that we will see this, I think, trend and decline. We're actually gonna see, I think, a lot of this kind of polarization that you're talking about. Absolutely. Interestingly, Arjun, do you see a continuation of perhaps an erosion of these, let's call them universal values, common policies, uh, whether we're talking about the US or the European Union? I think there are two things to be said here. One is that universal values uh, uh, remain active, but there's a weakness in universal mechanisms, which is to say global governance mechanisms, which can translate the middle ground into effective global policy with local translations. I think that's one part. The second part indeed has to do with the media point that my colleague just made. I think here we, what we need to observe is that in the world of media now with increasing speed of communication, saturation of information, growth of social media, growth of let's call it civilian journalism, which is non-professional but very productive, with all these things, I think one law, and I uh, use the word law, is that good news travels very slow, bad news travels very fast. So when you have good solutions to things anywhere locally, it's very tough for people to find, them, find out about them because the good news is drowned by the speed and saturation of bad news. And here I think uh, the media does need to examine itself both from the point of view of bias and a kind of interest in sensationalism and so on, but also something deeper, which is to say people who are interested in communicating bad news, hate messages and so on, have for some reason become infinitely more skilled. And here ISIL is a great case where they're masters of the media and are operating use uh, the bad news law, the speed of bad news, to build up constituencies worldwide, as we know, among young people very far from the Middle East. So we need to examine why good news is not able to move as fast as bad news. As that bad news moves faster, though, Arjun, where do you think it will leave particularly uh, some of the European Union common policies, founding principles, Schengen policy towards refugees, borders? How do you see the situation in 2016? I think the Europe, the Europe question is extremely interesting to me. I was recently in Berlin for a, a whole week giving lectures, meeting people, and I see that one of the things that has not sufficiently been done is to connect uh, 
the challenges and solutions to the refugee crisis with the very recent also 2015 euro crisis. Those two things are seen as largely separate stories, separate issues and separate problems. For me, they are a single problem that, have to do, that has to do with the question, how can you construct a single Europe, which is an economic reality, which does not leave countries which are at the European border. It turns out that the countries that bore the brunt of the euro crisis, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, are also on the front line, and the Balkan countries, the front line of dealing with the refugees. This is a true perfect storm. And the European Union need to recognize that there will be no collective European solution through Schengen, through Dublin, or anything else until there's a healthy, equitable solution to the euro crisis that does not favor only the very big banks, uh, the IMF, and the multilaterals, but takes into account working people, pensions, uh, and lifestyle throughout Europe, not just in Germany and in the Northwest. So the euro crisis is crucial to connect to the refugee crisis. Otherwise, we'll have two unsolved problems continuing unsolved in 2016. Interesting point he made there, but you could apply that principle, Basma, to the Middle East too and say there can't be a solution to have a more equitable distribution of wealth and power here too. I mean, we've seen this continuation of the aftermath of the Arab Spring leading to polarization, countries on different sides of where they stand to the idea of change in the Middle East and the Arab world, um, and that manifesting itself in conflict zones from Libya. Um, Syria and so on. Do you think that's going to continue in 2016? Uh, well, absolutely. And you know, the challenges for many of the Middle East countries too is that we're now dealing with the reality of less than fifty dollars uh, a barrel of, of oil, uh, and that's really important because that's going to really decrease the revenue stream for many of these countries. And so, how are you? Whether they're they're independent on uh, workers' remittances from oil-rich countries or produce oil themselves, they're all the entire Middle East really is very dependent on oil as a ba major commodity that they sell, and the, the income of that is obviously going to go down. We know that the social contract, and this really, whether it's Europe or the Middle East, it's really about the social contract is changing, i.e., the relationship between the citizen and the state. You know, that, that kind of paternalistic state order that existed, whether it was in Europe, in terms of you had a certain lifestyle and one would expect from that type of guarantees from the state in terms of whether it's low inflation, uh, increasingly subsidized uh, uh, prices, etc. All of that is being eroded in a fiscal space whereby governments have less and less that they can spend. We have less of a corporate tax base because, again, they're evading uh, uh, taxation. And at the same time, we look at the reality that, you know, manufacturing is a difficult uh, thing to hold on to. Europe and, and, and the West, particularly the United States, are relying less and less on manufacturing manufacturing and on jobs that come from the industrial sector. So right, much what about here in the Middle East I want to get, get into? We've seen this sort of mm -hmm. polarization on the same idea of the change in perception of what my social contract, what my expectations are of, of, of my government uh, during the Arab Spring. But that's, that didn't end the way most people hoped, did it? And it's just led to this polarization and conflict. Absolutely. You know, in, in many ways, the Arab Spring was born out of the reality that governments can no longer provide that rentier or autocratic bargain that they mm -hmm. had provided for decades, which was, you know, passive states don't ask for political rights, and in exchange, we will give you X, Y, Z. The state is unable to provide that. That's the reality, whether it's because of lower oil prices or mm -hmm. increasingly in trying to cater to corporate interests or cater to international financial agreements. So there's no going back to it for 2016? I what, think that what are we heading towards then? Well, no, we, we, unfortunately, that the reality is that the, the deregulation, the very process of breaking down that social contract has already started. It's really hard to bring that back. The challenge for the Middle East is to be able to attract foreign investment to fill the gap. It's unable to do that. The reality is the neighborhood effect of bad news from the region is unable for governments to attract the kind of foreign investment that they need in order to really provide the jobs and economic prosperity that so many of those young people went out to the streets to ask for throughout the Arab Spring in 2011. All right. Arjun, uh, the failure, some would say, of the Arab Spring, at least thus far, has prompted the rise of even more extreme groups, uh, ISIL and so on. Do you think a world where groups like ISIL in the East play uh, such a prominent role and where the likes of Donald Trump and 
Marine Le Pen play a prominent role is a world where coexistence becomes less likely in 2016, or are we being over alarmist about this? So uh, I think this is a vital question. This is the point in, an, in my thinking in which we have to give some special and specific analysis about the Middle East beyond the, I think, proper and appropriate global competitive trends we have been observing. And on the Middle East, there are two things that I would like to say. One is there is no walking away from the special nature of the problem generated by uh, the birth of the State of Israel, and in particular, the affiliation of Israel uh, as a major uh, ally and proxy for the United States in its foreign policy interests in the Middle East. I think whether it's the Iran issue or whether it's other things having to do with the Arab Spring, whether it has to do with the Palestinian crisis, whichever one you name, I think it's important not to forget that uh, uh, Israel's status and politics and relationship to the U.S. are simply an unavoidable factor. The other one, of course, indeed is oil. But the third one, the one I think is most important, is that in the Middle East, unlike in, uh, in either Africa, East Asia, South Asia, or the Atlantic world, we are seeing a reenactment of Cold War politics on an unprecedented scale. The big players in the Middle East, look at Syria, without a doubt are Putin and the U.S. government, whether it's Obama or anybody else. We are seeing here a replay of U.S.-Russia politics, not much changed since the Cold War, as well as a, a, rem, a remainder of the Ba'athist politics of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on in Syria, in Iraq, and in many other countries in the Middle East. The, the world of Ba'athist politics has not disappeared, but it is in a dangerous state of disassembly and mm. therefore is available to all kinds of groups, not right. least ISIS, which has got huge support from the ex-Iraqi army. But I think the big picture is U.S. and the Soviet Union. So the answer is going to lie in whether the current leadership in the U.S., and the USS, uh, not the USSR, that's my slip, uh, Russia, Russia of course, are yes. able to get beyond Cold War, Cold War polarity, All because right. that is killing the Middle East. Getting beyond polarity, there was a bit of good news if we can shift gears when it came to climate change. We had this deal. But all throughout 2015, we were hearing of studies like the one that came out in Nature Climate Change in April, saying that weather patterns are becoming more extreme. Uh, where do you think we're heading in 2016? Can a change in climate change uh, uh, really be pulled off? Can this deal be respected that makes a real difference to what people are facing? Yeah, you know, in all of these agreements, international agreements, you know, the proof is in the pudding in terms of implementation. It's a lot easier to get people in a room to agree to something, but then they have to go back to their national councils, their national parliaments, and start implementing the deals that they signed on to. And that's where there's a lot of slippage. That's so where there's the potential. Or? Well, you know what, actually, what keeps me optimistic is what I see is actually a real global shift in values. You know, I see this in my students, I see this around me, in the sense that people really think of climate change as a perennial issue of their generation. And that's something quite new. This is something that I think has now become uh, almost as, 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 as clear as the world is round. And that's something that wasn't there, I think, mm -hmm. five, ten years ago. So the global consensus, the normative change that we see today about climate change is what's going to keep, I think, the pressure from the population, from the people, actually, in this case, on their governments to implement the deals that they signed in just, Paris. Just a final thought, Bessemer. All of this, of course, is uh, interconnected. We talk about extreme weather and climate change they say it's the the poorest that suffer from extreme weather more than the richest right absolutely absolutely whether it's coastal fishing areas whether we're talking about poor countries that are often on the front line and have don't have the proper studies and and if you will environmental protection against these issues it's absolutely the case and that's one of the things that I think we see mm -hmm. in Paris recently was an agreement and understanding that it's also part of the responsibility if you want to get this done you have to have developed countries the Western countries help the poor countries to implement this. It's not enough to just sign on the dotted line. You need to provide money and resources to ensure implementation.
All right, let's hope for a better 2016, no matter what 2015 uh, looks like. Let's thank our guests, because we are out of time. Best normal Mani here in the studio. Arjun Apadurai in New York. And thank you for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on the program page of our website, aljazeera.com. You can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story, or tweet us at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and all the team here, for now, it's goodbye.